Hello Multi Magnus Magnuson Masterminds and thank you to Mark Williams for that mention. Mark's uh, he's a Patreon pal. Just thought I'd mention that. Thank you Mark for being a Patreon pal. That's why you and all my other followers get additional content. Mm. Glen Morangy. Nicely resinous sweet whiskey. Um, very, very different to Bruchladi, I have to add. And this is going to be the subject of this extras, 894. Is it 5? 895. Extras. In my last extras in 894, I happened to talk about my visit for a week to Bruchladi Academy shortly after it started. Very unusual in the old days, I can call them that now, where distilleries would actually have a, a, an option available that you could go and study whiskey making and have a get immersed in whiskey for a week for a fee. And Springbank were providing that option, but I didn't know so much about the Springbank option. And the frequency of its availability, although I knew someone had been on it and talk, spoke very highly about it. But I reasoned that Brewerclady were about two years up and running. Um, they obviously had considerable experience. They were putting their brand out there. They were very noticeable at a point when there was no other distillery starting. They had a big advantage in that respect. And so I signed up for their Whiskey Academy because they had their own bottling plant. They had they were just starting out and the, also it was an excuse to visit Isla. Such an important part of the Scotch whisky making world and naturally I took my camera with me. Um, I, I didn't, I did, well, I think I did have a mobile phone in those days with the buttons on it. <laughs> you remember that time when internet was dial up. Yeah. And um, so I was taking proper photographs. Nowadays we keep things on a USB stick, we stick it into the computer, we offload from our mobile devices or our phone and we are our cameras and we have all these f editing facilities and the problem is we take so much material that it becomes unimportant because it's just a load of white noise and when it's on a stick, you know, you put it away and then you forget about it. When you have a physical card and paper album, it's different. It create, allows you to create something so much more meaningful and substantial that is historical to your life. And so I, I've been requested by, hey Rafi, show us the album. So here it is. And I'm going to read out the front cover. Distillery Week on Isla. 24th to 29th of May 2004, weather, warm sunny, cloudy at odd times, 62 degrees Fahrenheit, some breeze. See, if you're going anywhere in Scotland, the first thing you need to know, whatever, is the forecast. And will there be any midges? And on May, on Isla, the midges are only just getting out of hibernation, so it's not too bad. And I also describe this as the longest and most expensive drinking session of my life. <laughs> right, what have we got? Well, first of all, we've got my Academy Certificate signed by Jim McEwen. There you go. Ralphie Mitchell. You see that? Successfully. Successfully, yeah. Because if it wasn't, hadn't been successful, I wouldn't have got one. And um, attended having successfully completed one week's intensive study at the Brochladi Single Malt Academy and uh, has been awarded the title. I wonder if I still hold it or whether it's been revoked for bad behaviour. <laughs> A single malt ambassador. Who, me? Pff, I doubt it. Um, and that was dated 28th of May 2004. Uh, to get the certificate, I had to pass an exam. I won't bore you with all the questions. There was 48 odd questions, and some of them were easy and others were hard. 
Uh, so I'm going to put that aside now. And I've got a wee fold out map of Isla and Jura Whiskey Trail in 2004 before Kilhoman um, had appeared in the scene and at the time when Art Naho was simply a passing um, notion in some office in Glasgow on a Friday afternoon. So, the thing about an album is it's not just about the photographs, it's about the dialogue that you put in with it. It's about the cutoffs and the photocopies that you put in, explaining and adding context to it. And this makes it much more meaningful than just a selection of photographs. The first introduction is the place itself. I think any distillery, you need to have photographs, not just of the building and of the interior and of the bottles and the bottle shop. You need to get the environment because the environment is key to the presence of the distillery and to its identity. And the water that you see in Loch Indal, um, bit cloudy, over cloudy at the moment, so overcast, so quite dark, but when the sun is shining it gets that colour that you see on the gates of Bruchladi distillery, that turquoise green-blue colour that you get in a lot of Bruchladi's brandings. So I just basically settled in, they had accommodation at the distillery, lovely food. We went out and did a wee bit of peak cutting with one of the locals, an absolute gentleman and a character who actually gave us the tools <coughs> so that we could cut the peat ourselves and get the feel of it and no smell. When you're cutting peat, there's no smell at all. It's very, very inert until it's actually burning. And you're cutting down using a particular cutting speed, which is quite narrow, and it brings out specific blocks. An arduous and a very boring task, but for an hour or so, we were quite happy to get on and do it. We also visited the well, the uh, source of Brochladi's bottling water, and very important because we drank that water, we got to taste the water. And the more you taste water, the more you will notice that water has taste. I'm just telling you, so as you know. Many of you already know, but there's no point, no harm in a wee reminder. So it was called the Dirty Botty Well. Uh, um, I'll let you figure that one out. And um, we also visited Lefroig to look at the malting floors because Brookladdy doesn't have malting floors. And this is hugely insightful because there's so much more to malting barley and kilning barley than you think. It's about balancing it all off. And balancing it off depends on the moisture levels in the, the wood and the peat that, you, that you're burning, whether it flares up or smoulders, whether it's a hot day or a wet day, if it's warmer, it's going to happen quicker. They may have to, have to spray in, the, in the, the, the kiln, have to spray with a hose the barley just to stop it drying out too quickly. Because if it's damper and it dries out more slowly, it absorbs more of the peat. And to their credit, all credit to Lafroy, they actually still do this. One of my first, in the, 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 the milling, the mill, uh, I'll just give you some quick information that um, when they're grinding down the kilned barley, they're producing 20% fine flour, 65% coarse grain flour, and 15% husk. And the reason for the husk in there is husk will actually hold peat molecules in it, because it's the coat on the outside of the barley. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a very important component, just the husk, although it's inert in terms of flavor, it stops the flour in, of the barley clogging and 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 become turning into porridge at times v varieties of barley behave more differently than you realize and there's a real it's a fine tuning it takes experience to know how to deal with one compared to another and how to to sort out a problem if it starts to occur rather than fully occurring and there's big allen there um at the um where we're with the mash, the mash tun room, very hot place, very hot job. Who needs a sauna when you work in a distillery um, down in the mash tun with a great big sweeping brush washing down the walls? I mean, well, this is seriously hard work, folks. And many, many people, even visitors to a distillery, you very rarely get to see that. I actually participated in that and very, very insightful. Um, also, the sparging of the kilned barley. 
is increasingly, it happens three times at Bruchlari with increasingly hot temperatures to not remove all the sugar at once in one go because it just doesn't work that way but to do it in increments. Adding yeast to the wash back um, and of course lots and endless fun and lots of giggles when you actually open up the washback lid and stick your nose in and take a good whiff of the carb whiff of the carbon dioxide that is coming out from the fermentation tank and of course as you know carbon dioxide is an essential component it is literally it's the oxygen for plants and plant life um, no plant life no wildlife um, the natural world thrives in carbon dioxide it breathes carbon dioxide this is why when you speak to plants, they grow faster. Did you know that? Because you're breathing on them and our breath contains con concentrated carbon dioxide, which is why you shouldn't wear a mask all the time because you're rebreathing carbon dioxide and you're, get you're giving yourself essentially oxygen starvation slowly over time, which can cause, basically can cause brain damage. That's an opinion. That is an opinion. Then down to the spirit still. Um, where in with a hydrometer, do some checks, how's the clean cut going, you know, as the time goes on, the alcoholic um, volume concentration drops, so you get lower and lower hydrometer readings, you know you're heading into the fence, then at that point, <coughs> under supervision, <coughs> you turn over the tap and you go from the receiver tank into the fence tank, and the fence will be recycled in the next, in the next run of the stills, the wash stills. Some students and me um, in my Bruchlady boiler suit, learning stuff, more stuff. Barrels. <clears throat> they had a cooper at Bruchlady, his name was John, an absolute gentleman, very, very lovely person who, very patient, took a lot of time with me, showed me how to de deassemble and assemble um, part of the bar, I wasn't going to do the whole thing, um, but take the top off, see inside what a, um, you know, the, the actual, you, you don't know what a barrel looks like until you've seen it from the inside. Simple as that. So I took the opportunity, the deep charring going on, ex-American bourbon cask, a new barrel head on it because the previous one was warped and more likely to leak over time. Simple as that. There's the filling tank at the filling house. And my cask, while I was there, I bought a barrel of Bruchlady single malt whiskey. I still have it. It's not at Bruchlady anymore. It's in another warehouse somewhere else in Scotland. It's now about 16, coming on 17 years old. I will bottle it at some point. Um, I don't know when, um, except to say that I'd never bottle anything until it's ready to be bottled, because I'm quite vain about it. Um, but there's me filling the cask with an absolute gentleman called Duncan McGilvery. If you go through the Ralphie Ar archive, you will see an interview I did with Duncan in his manager's office. He was the manager of the distillery at the time. And in my opinion, he, he was the quiet man behind the se scenes that really kept the ship afloat. The practical stuff, the, the improvisation that he, and his skill as a practical engineer, and just having the practical skills for repair, recycling, um, re-propositioning things for other uses. The man was remarkable, uh, an absolute gentleman. He's one of these people in the whiskey industry I'll never forget. I'll never forget him. Absolutely top class bloke. And a very photogenic picture. There's, there's me with Jim McEwen and he's banging away in barrels, but here's the one I prefer, which is me at the stencil rack, because you, you can't take this picture anywhere else but in a distillery. Ah, there, that should be better, it should be in focus now. Moving on, time is precious. So I'm doing a wee bit of barrel assemblage um, and with giving up some details about the roughly the rule of thumb, what percentage of flavour will come from fresh fill casks, how long it will take, refill casks, how long that will take, the type of casks, the type of wood. Um, and also important to mention, the progress of whisky maturation in a cask is not linear. 
it doesn't get older and better and older and better on the straight line. It waves considerably. And when I tasted a sample from my cask of Broth Laddie at 12 years old, frankly, it was pretty rotten. But when I recently tasted a sample at 16, it was, oh, it was everything I hoped for. Some years, a content of a barrel will not be good. And then the following year, due to the alchemy, the alchemy of maturation, the flavour can trans transform. Any distillery anywhere in the world will testify to that. All you have to do is ask. So a little bit of coopering and then round the warehouses. Jim McEwen, um, each evening about four o'clock, <coughs> would take us on a tour round different warehouses. Warehouse one, warehouse two, warehouse seven, warehouse six. And we basically get some valuable insight into the casks and how they were behaving and how they're maturing. It was fascinating and it was unique. It's, it's a great thing to go and visit a warehouse, but to be able to spend an hour in a warehouse with someone who knows them very, very well is, is all together takes things to a different level. And that's, that's where it was my favorite photograph from it. There you go. That's Ralphine Brook Laddie Warehouse 2004. Oh my goodness, how time flies. Uh, the students receiving tanks. I don't want to show, I've got to respect the other students' privacy, so I'm not going to linger on their photographs. The bottling plant at Brook Laddie and students receiving a certificate. Wonderful news, everybody passed. And this, this is now my favourite photograph from the experience. And I'm in the corner of a building. I'm sure you can see that. There we go. It's very quiet. Silent. Sun coming through the window. And I'm just sitting there leaning on a cask. And there's a conversation going on there. One of the most important conversations anyone has when they're visiting a distillery. And that is the conversation between the visitor and the distillery itself. Because this distillery is its own character. <coughs> its own entity. Its own personality. And you need to have a quiet spot just to, to listen with your feelings and get the, get the feng shui, the proximity, the spirit of of the place uh, around the I'm going to conclude now with um, the the warehouses up the back had a number of galvanized large pot stills behind them called Loman stills they came from Dumbarton distillery from Inverleven and they produced Inverleven single malt which I bought a bottle once from Cadenhead and I was not impressed and these Stills, one of them is is now used for producing botanist gin at Brochladi Distillery. And I'm just going to read you out a message that was written in permanent felt tip marker on these galvanised, one of these galvanised steel boilers. And I'm going to read it out because it was written in the expectation that nobody would ever see it and probably nobody would pay it any attention. But life is not like that. And I'm going to read it out to you so that it becomes indelible on the internet. And it's a message from Michael McLaren, who worked at Dumbarton Distillery shortly before it closed. And here's his message to us all. I, Michael McLaren, aged 45, almost, have a wife and four children who love me. At the closure of this malt distillery on the 29th of the 6th, 1991, what will things be like in 10 years' time? Question mark. <coughs> and he concludes with <coughs> a little Latin phrase, Deo volenti, which means God willing in Latin.
And he wrote that message, it's probably completely gone now from, erased, it's vanished over time, but from the Loman still that it was written on. But I took a photograph of that and then I transcribed it into this album and I've read it out to you so that the whole world knows. And if Michael is still around, um, he says, what will things be like in 10 years time? And the answer is very different. And in 20 years time, very, very different. And uh, in 30 years time, um, one of those Inverleven stills is producing some of the finest gin that Scotland can make. It's not all bad news. Whatever happens, life goes on and things will change. And they don't always change for the worst. Sometimes they change for the worst because you need that before things get better. And that has been the case for these stills which were bought by Brooke Laddie um, and repurposed for use at Brooke Laddie Distillery. Uh, a little bit of a little bit of Scotch whisky history, mock mates. Um, there's a few more distillery visits in there to Bowmore. Lafroy, Lagvullen. Uh, we saw the outside of Lagvullen. We didn't go in because, um, you know, I don't know if the. It's not a very accessible distillery, put it that way. You get the tour and that's it. But staff are doing what they can. But it's the corporate, corporate control. It just it kind of kills personality a wee bit just by its very nature. And. Um, I concluded it, funnily enough, here we are, there's Bunahaben and we've got Kulila as well. There's Kulila there. And shortly after I got home, I went to Rosebank Distillery, which is the final page in this book. Because I just wanted to get a feel of that distillery. But of course, at all the, 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 the fences around it, decommissioned, it was mothballed and um, what I noticed when I went through a gap round the back was that the lawns outside the distillery were very neatly tended to, it was far from neglected and there were security cameras up there and it was shortly thereafter that someone allegedly broke into that distillery and cut up the stills with a grind, uh, an angle grinder to remove them for copper scrap and I find that very 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 hard to believe when I could clearly see security cameras about the place and somewhere which might not be in use but it was certainly being looked after just saying just saying I believe that Rosebank stills are being used actively in another distillery somewhere else in the world but that's my personal opinion I think that was a complete. Um, as, to, as to them being stolen at Rosebank, I think that's just a complete fabrication, in my opinion, because it is an opinion. You still allowed them. That's my album, folks. If you go anywhere, don't just leave stuff in a USB stick. Create the album, because when you come back to it, and you, you read what you've written all these years ago, when you see the people that you met all these years ago and you have that extra insight beyond the pictures themselves, um, it becomes much more substantial and meaningful. Um, and that's important because as we get older, we need these points of reference to remind us that seeing the past, we actually had some amazing adventures and we did some wonderful special things when other people weren't even thinking about it. There you have it. I'm Ralphie, thank you for watching. Hope you've enjoyed this. <coughs> a wee bit dry tonight in the bothy. What better get to better get better get another wee, wee drop of drop of whiskey here to wet the whistle. Hope you've enjoyed this. Um there's been other distilleries as well that I've visited and I'll maybe tell you about them in the future and show you my albums from them, but hey, there's no rush. 
Hope you've enjoyed this. Please subscribe, click like, you bang the bell if it's still there, whatever, and all the rest of it. <laughs> and I hope you, you've been very welcome to the Bothy. Hope you've enjoyed your visit and your little session, your little malt session, and we'll see you soon, malt mates.